diggly 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 do. Let me stop this. It's amazing how, how annoying Irish music gets very quickly. Hold on, here we go. Hi up! There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your old pal Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And it is a delight for me to have with us in the neighborhood a musician, a novelist, and a playwright. He's an Irish-born New Yorker through and through. His name is, oh, and let me ask you before I really give you the full introduction, is it Kerwan or Kerwin? Kerwin. Kerwin. See, I thought you were like, Kerwin. Like, Kerwin. Kerwin. It's like, uh, she just had in the morning. <laughs> so, top of the morning to you, by the way. He formed this band called Black 47 that mixed politics and comedy and rousing rock and roll. Um, Irish Central once called him the best Irish American band of the decade. He is also, as I said, a playwright, and he's got two shows that he's hoping will come to Broadway if there's ever a Broadway again. One is called Hard Times, uh, which sounds like a dirty magazine, and Desert Rose, which sounds like an underage dirty magazine. So he's hoping <laughs> will come to Broadway. Fiddly diggly diggly D. Larry Kerwin is here with me. Shalom, Larry. Shalom, Rabbi. How are you? I'm, uh, thank God, I am fine. How are you eight months into pandemic times? I'm fine, you know, I'm a, I'm a playwright. Uh, and a novelist, as you said, so it's easy for me to just go back into, you know, writing. And uh, so my schedule is not that much changed. I mean, it's an awful time and, uh, you know, there's someone responsible for it. And, you know, hopefully on November 3rd, that will get sorted out. So I, I see you're not perhaps a Trump fan. No, not at all. I'm a New Yorker, so we were never Trump fans. We knew him right from the start, so... Well, so are you going to perhaps vote for uh, Joe Jorgensen and Jeremy Spike Cohen, who, by the way, are on the ballot here. They're, they're literally on the, the presidential <laughs> ballot. You've also got, and let's not forget uh, what other party is here. Uh, shall we forget Jordan Cancer Scott and Jennifer Tepool. <laughs> There's actually a guy, a guy whose middle nickname is Cancer, and he's on the ballot here. Oh, I'm not yeah. I don't think I'll vote for him. No. <laughs> so, I, I'll give the others consideration, but not him. No. Now, I heard you mention somewhere uh, in an interview somewhere that at one point you were illegal. You were not, quote, a legal immigrant. Were you here for a while on a vacation or a visa, and then you stayed and eventually got your papers? How did that all work? You're an, you're an American now, right? Yeah, I I have joint citizenship. You can do that uh, because of an agreement between the Irish government and the U.S. government. But yeah, I came, uh, I came as a student to check it out and I decided I was going to stay here and it took me three years to get my papers right and then I was finally able to go back on a visit. Um, but yeah, we call ourselves illegal. The, the term now is undocumented. But, oh, um, right. Uh, you were, but at some point you were able to get the documents so because you yeah, know, three minutes. I, it, but it took time, you know, and uh, but it d does give you a, a different view of America when you come in and you're illegal. You become very aware, for one thing, of, of making sure you don't break any laws. You know, so it's one of the things I hold against the Trump administration, this anti-immigration Thing because the last thing uh, an immigrant wants to do is to be in the public light, as it were, so that you can, so things can go wrong or you can get picked up. So this whole idea that immigrants take money from legal Americans is just so wrong. You're trying to keep out of the system as much as you can and pay your taxes and everything, get everything right, so that when you do go for your hearing, you know, you're clean as a whistle. Yeah. I know I went to the hearing doctor this week and they, they pulled wax out of there. You don't want to know. It, it looked like he was pulling a Torah out of my head. But let, let me ask you, uh, may I call you Larry, by the way? Sure, of course. Okay, okay. So, and you're so David? Or what's, what's well, your 
What's your my, first my name? My name is Saul. You can call me Saul. Oh. Saul, oh, okay. Saul, 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 or Rabbi, or Rebbe, or Darling, if, if, if we get along <laughs> really, really well. So well, my question is, you grew up, though, in Ireland in, in a place called Wexford, which I know only from like an old Clancy Brothers song about a woman who poisons her husband. But his yeah. is a question for you. Was it like Angela's Ashes, or was it kind of a nice dad? Well, Frank McCord is a great friend of mine. We were, we knew each other really well. Uh, his generation was a generation before mine, so that, you know, I know what he was saying was true. It had improved a bit by the time uh, I was growing up. But at the same time, nobody had any money. You know, it was, it was a poor society and uh, you had to make do as best you could. So, but it was, it, it was a good childhood, I think. You know, it was a beautiful place, Wexford. It's actually where the Kennedys are from. That's its, oh. its main fame. Um, it, it was a seaport. My father was a sailor. Uh, my grandfather had a farm close by. So, you know, I, I lived between the town and the country. And I was raised by another grandfather who was a, uh, a stone cutter. <clears throat> a wow. monumental sculptor, he made headstones. So he had a great sense of history, even though he'd left school at 13 to become a, a stonecutter, be apprenticed to his own father. But I learned so much through him because he was the youngest son of, uh, of eight, and his father had witnessed the great potato famine in 1847. So that, you know, I got the stories secondhand from... You know, I was only one, uh, one generation removed in a sense because I was hearing the stories that his father had told him about it. And it left a, a big impact. So sort of when I did found a band in New York that became popular, uh, Black 47, that was in honor of 1847. And it was also, for your information, it, it, we used it in the same way as the Jews used Never Again. It was the same, Black 47 meant the same thing. So uh, there was a history behind the band and be, behind me growing up. Right? And I used it all, like I, I was in a sushi restaurant two weeks ago and I tried eel that wasn't cooked properly. I'm like, Ugh, never again, never again. I, it's just, you'll be amazed how often that comes up in, uh, with my people. It, it's extraordinary. So what was it about New York, because New York is, has been an expensive place for a long time. You, you say that Wexford, you know, nobody had any money, it was kind of poor. It's not as if you were living the, the Woody Allen life in New York. You know, you, no. have, you have no money. Yeah. And the people you were with were all squatters, I'm sure. I mean, how did you live in those first few years? Well, at that point in the, the mid 70s, um, CBGBs was happening and everything. And, Everybody lived on the Lower East Side, and you could get an, an apartment for, say, $150 a month at that point. And it was an old emigrant area, I mean, Irish first, then Jewish. In fact, in my first apartment, it was furnished from a synagogue, so that I sat at a pew when I was having, when I was eating. You know, I sat on a pew this morning. I, I... Glad I remembered to flush, but you know, I don't even know what that means. I'm so sorry. I apologize. But it's true. Like if you were in part of that artistic community during that era, everybody helped each other out. I know that Dave, uh, the guy who, who hosts this program, he interviewed uh, Deborah Harry a, a couple of months ago for yeah. a, a magazine. And she was saying, you know, she put out this book about her life and what it was like downtown in those years. You know, you, you ate French fries and you hung with everybody and everybody sort of shared everything. And it was, you got along. It was cool. Yeah, there was, was a real sense of community because nobody had any money. I mean, I used to see uh, Debbie walking around the streets. In fact, at one point I got a kiss from her because she thought I was someone else. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Didn't that happen>? <laughs> <laughs> her tax accountant, perhaps? Because <laughs> you did not... Thought I, was in, thought I was in a different band and uh, I was pretending to be be in that band and she told me how great I was on stage and I thought you know I think I could get a kiss out of her and I got one it was great she's a beautiful person oh well hell yeah oh that's that's a wonderful thing you're sure gonna say, oh yeah I've got an album coming out come on I'll play it for you and you just get anything or you get Montavani on the stereo and he's like yeah that's me yeah, the fifth woodwind that's that's uh, me in the background there who any other stories about those times that you must have met then uh, people like the Ramones and David Byrne and, and, and tell me some stories well, you know, 
Hilly, <clears throat> who was the um, Hilly Crystal, the yeah. Owner. Hilly Crystal <clears throat> was a great friend. So I had been playing in a place called the, the Bells of Hell, which was owned <laughs> by a guy called Mal Malachi McCourt and Frank McCourt. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and Hilly had the original CBGBs on 13th Street, just across the street from it. <laughs> so he moved over to the Bowery and the band I was in at the time became the first resident band there. But the business was really bad. And we were going back to Ireland. And I said, ah, Hilly, this place is never going to take off. So just get someone else in. And then we came back, the whole um, scene had started. And of course, I played there. But I got to see Seda Ramones on their first night there. I saw Wait, David The first Garner. night the Ramones played. <laughs> yeah. In New York at, at, at CBG. So could you tell, I mean, be honest, did it sound like a revolution or was it just, well, these are short songs, they're very loud and noisy and yeah. Did, I mean, did you realize history was happening? No, I, I thought maybe it was a cartoon because they, they kind of looked like cartoon characters. And the weird thing was, because I always remember this, the, the bartender who I didn't like at the time, he was very nasty kind of uh, English guy. And he, he called me over and he said, you know these guys up here? They're bloody fascists. And I was saying, I don't think so. I think they might be Jewish. And he said, it doesn't make any difference. They're fascists. I can tell they're fascists. <laughs> and that always stuck with me at that point. But no, and I, the great thing about both the Ramones and about um, Talking Heads was that each night you saw them, they got better. Wow. And which yeah. makes sense. Was there a band that you saw there during that era who never made it big, who you thought, oh, they should, they're great. They should, have, uh, they should have broken big. Well, the biggest band in there, uh, and they did make it to a certain degree, but by, were by far the best band, were television. Oh, band television. The Tom they, and, yeah. I was a huge fan of theirs. I went to see them every night. So quite often, the other bands would open for them because they were the, the big draw in there. So I remember one time Talking Heads were going to go on. And I really like Talking Heads, except... Uh, I remember one time having a pee next to <laughs> to David Byrne down in the in the bathrooms there, which were pretty wild. Right. And I was standing next to him, and I said, "What are, what kind of music are you guys doing?" He said, and he said to me, "You know, we're just not very good, but we're trying to be like everyone else." Huh. And and I was thinking it didn't sound right to me. I think he was having me on, but you know. No, uh, maybe he was just being uh, kind of, he was still figuring out the sound and he was still, still maybe not out. good yet, but we will, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's kind I of I remember when, when, when television were playing one time, uh, people kept shouting, turn off the radio, turn on the TV. Mm -hmm. That's the they way we're talking television. Heads. Yeah. Talking heads. But talking heads, I had, talking heads got better every night. I mean, the Ramones got to a certain point where they were just great at what they did. And then they, they thought, great, we got it. And it sounded always the same after that. But Talking Heads progressed every night. And even if you see David Byrne to this day, he's still trying new things. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, Dave uh, went and saw that Broadway show that he's hoping the, the American Utopia is wonderful. Right. Uh, or at least Dave says, says it. And actually, people can apparently, they feel Spike Lee filmed it. You can go see it on one of these prime channel things. But, yeah, but we're talking about all these other bands. Let's talk about you guys and the, the beginnings of Black 47 and, and saying, saying to yourself, I got these songs. What did, I need a band and I'm part of this scene. Or how did, how did that all coalesce? It happened, it happened totally different. Oh. I, I, I had had a, a record deal with a band called Major Thinkers, uh, or kind of a hot band it, it, on the Lower East Side uh, in the early 80s. And then <clears throat> we got signed up to CBS or to Epic Portrait. And we became kind of big for, for a little while. And we made an album and they couldn't figure out which single to release from it. And so they dropped us. And at that point I was thinking, you know, I've always wanted to become a playwright. So let me just chuck in this whole music thing or the professional side of it. Yeah. And for the next four years, I just wrote plays and how did you, whoa, whoa, how, whoa, were you working? I mean, how did you live? Uh, I Even used to get 50 bucks a month. How did you live? You know, well, I, 
I was still able to play music in bars and whatever, especially in the Bronx and the Irish area up there. I could go up there. And I also had a little, a little typing service. I used to type for people. Oh, and lovely. I became a really fast typist. But basically I did it through, um, you know, just playing a few gigs every month. You didn't have to make that much. And so, but for four years, I just totally concentrated on the theater, wrote nonstop, put on the plays, and I almost had a hit with one called Liverpool Fantasy, which was about the Beatles if they hadn't made it. And <gasps> where, where was that though? Were those all downtown? Were those in like theater for the new city and places like, uh, yeah. or uh, Mama, which, you remember which they were? Or the... Yeah, it, this one wasn't in, in one of the better known ones. It was in, uh, uh, I can't do the actual name of it, but it was a Puerto Rican community place. Oh, and Puerto Rican traveling theater, even though it didn't travel. That was the dumbest right, thing. Exactly. They called it the traveling theater, and it's sitting there for, for 30 <laughs> years in the same place. That, that, right. sorry, that's lying. <laughs> that is just, you know, you think Trump tells lies. That is a terrible thing to call a traveling theater, and there they are sitting there. This makes me mad. I'm sorry. Well, anyway, it, yes. it, it went from, a, you know, a, a showcase to an off-Broadway production, but then we ran out of money. And... and so I, after about four years, I was beginning to miss the stage. And one night I went for a walk and I went up to a place called Paddy Riley's. I just wanted to hear an Irish accent because I was living in Soho and I, I wasn't in the Bronx that much anymore. So I went up there and there was a band playing and they asked me to get up and play. And I was thinking, no, no, I don't, I don't play anymore. And the way the bartender, gave me a shot of whiskey and I said, all right. <laughs> I got up and I played all night with him. And then I was with the leader of the band at the end of the night, his name was Chris Byrne. And he was a, a New York City detective who was moonlighting at night, playing in a band called Beyond the Pale. And <clears throat> at the end of the night, he was, I could tell he was kind of in a bad mood. And I said, what's the matter, man? And he said, well, you know, the band Beyond the Pale is breaking up tonight. I have all these gigs in the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn coming up and I got no one to play them with. I said, I'll do it with you just on the spur of the moment. And, and then you're just a duo, that's two people. Or two did people. you grab quickly a drummer and, and the one? I, I brought along my drum machine. I, I was good at programming drum machines at the time. So I had this tremendous big beat and I played electric guitar and he played the Irish Illin pipes. They're the elbow pipes. And yeah. he also played tin whistles and the, the baron. So we were kind of like a two-man band. We went to the Bronx and uh, people hated us. I mean, oh. literally hated us because I had said, if we're gonna do this, we gotta do original music. And I have, I have a number of songs here. So let's get started with these. And we, we'll write a list of everything else. We kind of know other songs like Van Morrison ones and Irish ballads, anything. And they hated everything, get, even, uh, even the covers they hated? Because we were, we, you know, I'd come from CBGB, so it was in your face kind of thing. And Chris being a cop, he was wearing shades because he didn't want people to see who he was. So, so we looked pretty formidable and, you know, we were playing loud. And, you know, in Bronx bars, the idea is that the audience, you know, you bring your girlfriend along to talk to her and, you know, you're talking to the guys and there's televisions on and everything. Whereas we want them to look at us. It was like, you know, you want to, you're paying us to do this. So um, they hated it. But we got better uh, over the next couple of months. And, and as it turned out, which was lucky for us, there was a, there had been a boom. You know, the boom and bust economy over here. There had been a boom. And every Irish guy wants to do two things, own a bar and a racehorse. But it's often easier to own a, own a bar. So there was bars all over this area um, called Bainbridge Avenue in the Bronx. And so when we get fired from one, we'd go down the street to, to the next guy and he wouldn't have heard of us and said, I need a band because in, oh. unlike oh. the other boroughs, just yeah. the Bronx. And so we were up and down the avenue and then within six months, things started to, we started to get better and then we, we moved back into uh, Manhattan to this, that actual bar I mentioned before, Patty Riley's on 28th Street and 2nd Avenue. And then 
all the people that we like to say in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens started to congregate in there. And all of a sudden there's lines around the place and people began to notice it. Now my idea right from the start was that we would, we would just play in this Irish bar and people would have to come see us. We wouldn't go to CB's or any other place. Because you, for one thing, you don't get paid very well in the rock places, but in the Irish places, you get paid well. Mm. So we had things going for us. And then all of a sudden, Joe Strummer showed up from The Clash. And he was really into the band. And he kept insisting, you gotta play this place, you gotta play this. And I said, no, I got a plan, I got a plan. And then finally, I was getting so many calls from a place called Wetlands. The booker said, listen, I don't care. Just come and do it. Just get Strummer off my back, please. And so we went, we played there, and then it kind of took off. The record companies heard about us, and we got a, a record deal. And then we were, we were the biggest thing in New York for the longest time. And we were playing on Leno and Letterman, you know, O'Brien. Conan O'Brien was a good friend. And, and there were all sorts of personalities coming in. You know, Matt Dillon was, a, was there. Well, when you say that, that Conan O'Brien was a good friend, by the way. I mean, is he a good friend or just someone you had a drink with hearing or, or do you really know the guy and you pal around and what's he like? Great. But he hadn't made it at this time. He was, he, he was uh, a guy who used to come into another bar that we hung out and that Chris owned, uh, Rocky Sullivan's on Lexington. So he was, you know, there was a lot of writers used to go in there and you know, he had come from Harvard so he's hanging out with that Harvard crowd who were, you know, slumming in, in, uh, in Rocky Sullivan's. So all of a sudden he gets, uh, he gets his show, but he has to do a trial first. So I was the first guest he had. He wanted people, it, was, it wasn't being shown on television, it was being shown for the suits, but they had to do the full show. And so he had Black 47 as the band because he wanted you know, people yeah. around him who trusted him. And he, he actually wanted to talk about that play, Liverpool Fantasy, because at that point I was turning it into a novel and he was fascinated by that. So he figured this is something I can really relax on and we can, we can yeah. talk. So I was used to, really used to doing interviews at this point because that's part of your trade, you know, when you're a musician. So it was actually, I was kind of calming him down as he was asking the questions because he was nervous. You know, the, it's an awful thing. It is, the suits are out there watching. Everyone from, was it NBC? Whatever he was with, they're all watching. And I could feel the pressure even. It was like, you know. You have to put it to, to, do you think you ever see it um, in the years past? Is that somewhere? Does NBC have it in the vault or has, has, does Conan have a copy? I think that'd be amazing to watch. It would be, yeah. I, I, I never saw it since, but uh, I'm sure they have it. But I don't think they played it, you know. Or maybe they played it when he was off on a, you know, taking a, a night off or something, but I never heard about it. But then we were on a show maybe four or five times after that. Oh, well, you know, let me, let me, I want to remind people, though, that we're talking with Larry Kerwin. I do apologize. We're having some, um, we're hearing you just fine. But there are times when the, the video and the audio are playing catch up with each other. So I, I do apologize, uh, you know, we're, at least we're not losing you. At least you're not freezing and, and, and you're physically there. And the audio is great. Just think, close your eyes and think of radio, which is, so <laughs> I don't, I don't, radio, Larry Kerwin. As we say in Black 47, shit happens. <laughs> it's <laughs> you're true. gonna get through it, yeah. Well, good shit happened to you because at some point you wrote one song, the one song that will be on you know, if, if that tombstone carver was still alive, he would put on your tombstone, this is the guy who wrote Funky Kaylee. Uh, does, does that piss you off, though? You've written probably well over 200, 300 songs at this point. But, oh, it's the Funky Kaylee guy. You owe that song so much, but it sometimes you're like, oh, I got 12 other fucking songs that are just as good. <laughs> well, you know, I've played that song so much and sometimes coming to it, I would think, here we go again. But the minute you hit the first notes of that, there's something about that song that even transposes me, you know, or transports me. And I'm into the story, but it, it, it's such a, a fun song for people and it takes away all their cares so that you think to yourself, great, I got into it too. And by the end of the song, you're kind of into it and that's, that's it. 
Yeah, there's something joyful. It, it really is a funny song and joyful and it just tells this wonderful story. But again, it's not the only song. If there were like five other songs of yours, I mean, yeah. just grab your EP of greatest hits. But I mean, it's like, you know, if, if, there, if you could recommend to people, if you like Funky Kaylee, you really should know these quote unquote obscurities in the Black 47 of Well, I, I, if you look at say, uh, you know, iTunes, Funky Kaylee is not the number one song. The number one song is The Big Fella uh, about Michael Collins, the oh, uh, yes, revolutionary yes. guy. And the second one, is James Connolly, uh, which is about a left-wing uh, organizer who got shot by the British. So, you know, it, it doesn't trouble me about fun people liking Funky Kaylee because, you know, every song the Black 47 did, and we've done maybe 150, uh, each had its own people who liked it, you know. There were but no- ones that you wish Every because you know they're the public votes, they choose these to listen to on iTunes or on YouTube or Spotify or wherever. Which ones do you wish were in, in there with Michael Connolly and in with, with you know some of the others? You know, I don't care. It's it, you know, I write, I write all the songs as best I can, and I do, you know, they're I write them for a reason, they're like children. You know, do you do you say, I wish I this. I, I prefer this guy to the other. There oh, might be a I, I do. I have 21 and a half children at home. <laughs> Several of them I hate. So, you know, I want to take this pillow and just press it on their faces once in a while and just be left with a good 18. But, uh, you know, but you know, there are some songs that you write and you think they're good while you're writing them and then they're like, meh, or, oh, this, this is really good, you know? No, I don't seem to think that way for some reason. It's just because I, I write all the time because I do so many musicals. Mm. At the point that uh, I'm continually writing, you know, I, I started to do a musical at the beginning of the pandemic because I, I knew this thing wasn't going to go away, having Trump there. He was going to mess it up so, sooner or later. His destiny had arrived and we were going to be there for, we were going to share his destiny with him. So Not if we vote for Princess Jamala, whatever her name is, Barbo. Yeah. So I wanted to do something that would just take my mind off the uh, whole thing. And so I, I had always an idea of writing a two-person musical because you can then get into the characters, especially about a relationship where they meet again, say, 25 years later. But I couldn't think of the, um, you know, the circumstances. And one morning I woke up just right soon after the pandemic started, and I knew what it was. It was just... It came to me that it, I would go back to the Lower East Side where I lived when I first came to New York, East Third Street and Avenue B, which was the center of the heroin district at the, at the time. So then the story just kept, came into my mind that a band, there's a, there's a couple in a band uh, called the Blue Diamonds. They were on the rise, kind of like Black 47 was. They go and get on MTV. I follow the same story. And then they get on the Letterman show, right? Which Black 47 got over that hurdle and went on. But the guy in the relationship doesn't show for Letterman, which is a big thing. You don't, you, you don't bomb out on Letterman. You, you, you don't bomb out on Letterman. So the woman, uh, Shelly is her name. She's from... Scarsdale, she goes back, she says, that's it, I can't take anymore. Goes back to Scarsdale, has a bit of a breakdown. When she comes out of it, she meets a businessman up there, gets married and has a daughter and she's involved in his financial dealings, he's a broker. And uh, 25 years later, the, their, their manager, the ex-manager calls and said, listen, I got great news, they're making a, um, a movie about the new wave punk scene down on Avenue B, uh, back when you guys are there, they've heard one of the songs and they want to feature the song, but they also want you to write three new ones. And she says, well, I'm out of the business. And he says, I, I hear Rick, who the, was the ex-boyfriend, is not in great shape. 
and he, she says, why don't you just go down and see him? Maybe you can just knock off some songs and do it again. And she's so curious. She goes down and that's where the, uh, the action begins. Wow. She walks in on him after 25 years. He's in the midst of an argument on the phone. And then she tells him and he needs money. He doesn't want to do it, but he needs money. And then the relationship starts again. And it's like, can they renew the relationship with the working one and the uh, romantic one? Oh, and the romantic. Oh, 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 my goodness. Yeah, yeah. So, but this is, not, is this going to be or still a two-person musical? Because you want to bring this to, to Broadway, which probably is the only thing Broadway will be able to afford in like 2022. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, all these things take their own course. But for now, I, no, I, I'd keep it as a two-person thing because it's just so intense because you can deal with the two characters. The problem in, is in some of the big musicals, it's hard sometimes to spend time on one character and to develop them. Uh, I mean, it works, but I really wanted to get into the whole idea of just two characters and your focus on them because, you know, that is part of our lives that there's a woman or a romantic partner and can it, after 25 years, can it work? Well, here's the question about a musical about these people. Is it a rock kind of musical or is it more Broadway? Because remember, if it's rock, you're going to have now characters who are supposed to be in their mid-50s. Exactly. Uh, which you, you rock out, you're in your mid-50s, but you know what I'm saying. Eight times a week, you, you, know, you don't get Angela Lansbury up there going, hey, go me, bang on me, ah, you know, you can't do that. So, Well, it, it, would be, it, would, it does deal with the, the rock world. And there are plenty of rock songs in there, but I've also put some rock songs that, that, that follow a Broadway thing, Broadway lines. And, but it's bittersweet because you're, you're thinking about, at the end of the first act actually is, they recreate the moment they were on MTV and they dress up in the old clothes that they still have, the, the, the costumes and they, they do, they do their song from MTV. So it, the first act ends great like that. It's like, we can do it still, you know? But of course, for us looking at them, what you're saying, they're in their 50s, that's bittersweet to look right. and, at the and people creating it. And they feel they've got it still. But, but everybody feels they've got it still at 50, you know, or that's the dream anyway. So you have so, a down, like well, I, you know, I've seen you um, in in videos like done a couple of weeks ago where you're doing one of your songs, and it's just all the energy that you had in your twenties is still quite literally there. But yeah. I mean, would you, if you, if we didn't have the pandemic and you still had a band, if not Black Forty Seven, which which broke up a couple of years ago, would you do like a three month tour with the bus and the life of style and going that it's beyond already. No, it's, it's, it, it's not that. It's just that I did it for 25 years with Black 47. So you've got to find new challenges. You know, the, I know how to do the touring thing, like the back of my hand, you know, I know how to survive it now. Because at first it's, it's hard going because every night's a party, you know, literally. And that can, that can wear on you. But I learned how to do, to, to party just a little bit, but to be able to go back to the room and write at that point. So I knew, I knew how to how far to go with my head to be yeah, I, able I, to. Write. It should basically be you should do percentages. It's like thirty percent sex, you know, ten percent drugs, and for sixty percent. I'm not that great with math. Sixty uh, percent rock and roll. So that's that should be the the kind of uh, swing that you have in there. Well, maybe forty well, percent sex, and, and you know, yeah. Well, it's something. up to everyone to find a way. You know, uh, one thing is the the rock life on stage. You're playing a guitar, you're moving all the time. You have that energy, and Black Forty Seven always did a straight two hour show every night. So yeah. you really just even to hold the audience for that long, your concentration has to be so intense. You know. Every moment is like that, and you come off the stage, you're electric, right? Uh, you can't go to bed, you know, it's, it'd be over. And you can't even write when you're that electric, you know, you, really? you, you go, I mean, I, I never liked hanging out in green rooms. I used to go out and hang out with the fans. 
And then often, oftentimes what we would do is we would say, uh, if the club, because clubs kind of want to close fairly early, we would say, we're going to such a bar, you're all welcome to come. So there would be this tremendous, uh, bar, t- bar owners love this, of course, because it could be a hundred people arriving in on a, Wow, uh, Monday night or something. <laughs> you miss that. You miss, you miss doing that. So not five nights a week, but maybe once a month or twice a month. You miss that kind of like hey, everybody, by the way, you just have a fantastic time. Two hours on stage, focused rock and roll, and then everybody come to the bar. Shots on me. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think you can do it to the same level if you're just doing it once a month. You know. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I do do it sometimes, and I'm always surprised it works and everything, but at the same time, there is an apprehension going into it that you're not going to be able to make it work, you know, at that point. But, do, you have, do you have a family now? I don't, I don't know your, your personal, oh, there's a personal behind you. Literally, as I asked that, uh, that pretty something just popped her head in, and now she's going slowly away. <laughs> so, <laughs> is she trapped in uh, there? Is she chained to a radiator or something? Or who is that? Uh, that's my wife. And oh, that's McMazel. Nick, how long have you been together? Uh, 30, 32 years. So was she a fan or did you meet her? How did you meet your, uh, your lovely lady there? She was a choreographer and I did music for her, for her modern dance company. Oh, that's wonderful. That, yeah. that, that's and is she, does she still work in the theater and in ballet or, opera or, or what does she do? She teaches dance now. Yeah, she's still in it. Wonderful. And we still now, go to the theater all the time. Yeah, we're still involved in all sorts of theater. So. Now, one of the, the symbiotic things beside, you know, between Irish and Jews, besides Briscoe, is that uh, you know, we both appreciate misery and horror and sadness and stuff. I mean, the first thing we were talking about was never again in the Holocaust. So yeah. there, you went through a period, though, in the 90s where just relentlessly bad things happen. How did you get through that? Tell some Jews, because Jews are just like, every little, if I caught my finger, oh, it's a tragedy, I'm off to, to Mount Sinai Hospital. How do you get through relentless tragedy? Um, Samuel Beckett said, I will go on, I must go on. And that's the way it is. And if you're in a rock and roll band that has a schedule ahead of it, you've got to go and do the things, you know, that you, you're signed up to do because you can't, the one thing in this business is you can't let people down. And we, that's the great thing about Black 47, we never did. And uh, we were loyal to everyone. And uh, because I knew that there's a day this will end and you don't want to be thinking, I wish I'd done that, you know, for that person. I, I was nasty to that person. You know, it's, it's part of your gig to, uh, to deliver on stage and then be some kind of a reasonable person, you know, for an hour after, then you can go back to your room and, you know. But then a psychiatrist would say, when do you get to mourn? When do you get to, like, if, if you're just plunging into work and not letting people down and get, going on tour and doing this and hanging in the bar and sort of forgetting your trouble, and you don't, obviously, but, but then at what point do you, can you crash and can you, uh, let the feelings that you need to get out, get out. Well, you kind of have to go on, you know, it's like, you, there's, there's no way about it because if you crash, you're letting down the band around you. And I was the leader, uh, I was the manager too, because that's the only way to um, be it for everyone to be able to make a living is if, if you've got to give 20% to a manager, you're not going to make any money. You're not, you know, and the band's not going to make any money. Uh, you know, I learned a lot about the economics of the business, but, but part of it was you, you, you can't let people down. You can go back to your room and you can crash and go, oh my God, you know. But in the end, oh my God's not going to do you any good. You've got to try and figure out how do I get out of this, you know? What do I do next? You know, we had all sorts of things we you know, shootings at the concert, um, you know, a serious van crash, which haunts me to this day, because it, it took so long, we went over twice, hit 
we hit black ice and went right over the van. Those vans are not, those big vans are not that steady. We hit the side thing, the, the, the concrete uh, siding. That one came right back up and went over again, hit it. So we're all up in the air and all moving. And uh, we had just gotten into the van and, and most of us didn't have the seat belts on. So, I would advise everyone never get into a van or a car without a seatbelt ever again, because I saw what it was like. We, we went. Uh, it, I don't know, even like singing in a concert without a seatbelt on. I won't go into Carnegie Hall unless it's got the strap, you know, and, and if it's a place like CBGB's, I would want the shoulder strap. I would want that too, honestly. <laughs> Let me ask well, you before. No, no, I, we did ask and, and um, to, to let you know, but I, I want to make sure because um, after this part of the interview, are you uh, able to stay with us and play the trivia game with Dave and a couple of theater critics and answer some trivia questions? Might be fun. No, I, I told uh, the guys before, I, uh, I told Judy who set up this, I, I have to go. You know why? Because my, my wife came up. <laughs> it's because they're about to uh, take a wall down downstairs and the, the workers are down there. <laughs> so, <laughs> how long can you hang with us then? How long do we still have you uh, with us? I can do another five minutes or so. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. So, so let's make them count. Let's. So, you are a novelist, a playwright, a literary kind of a person. So, you had some ideas that I haven't had time to listen to yet, but in a very condensed way. How the hell do you get through Ulysses? Let alone Finnegan's Wake. I would. I read Ulysses quite often, and. I, and I take part in, in Bloomsday on June 16th. And my advice to anyone is don't, don't start at the beginning. Just open up Ulysses anywhere you like, because it doesn't matter. It's not a serial kind of story. Just open it up any time, any place, and just read for three or four pages. Have a, have a good time. If you don't like that little section, go on to another one. But the one thing I would advise everyone is go to the end and read Molly Bloom's soliloquy, because that is probably the best piece of writing in the English language, I think. To this day, I keep waiting for something else to knock it aside, because it's one guy getting into the mind of a woman for the first time. And, and, that, and she's, by the way, she's diddling herself while, while she, she's talking. We don't remember that. She's kind of like, oh, my God. Oh, no, she's not. Well, he's on top of her. He only adds to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's giving her the old, you know, you know, being fruitful and, and multiplying in a sort of an Irish way. If you know yeah, what I mean. Well, yeah, you know, there's, there's, it's, there's not that much sex in Ulysses. You know, there was a lot of sex in it in 1904 when it, when it came out or when it was written about. Uh, I came out in 614 or something like that, 1914. But it's just, it reveals character and humanity in a way that had never been done and probably haven't been, hasn't been done since. You know? right, but let me ask you, Finnegan's Wake, have you, have you waded through that thing? No. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. No, I, I never will, but there are beauties in it. it well, no, if you, that means you've tried. You, that means again, I would say the same thing. Yeah, I, I have tried that and wasn't able for it. But I would and read... Really, uh, the Clancy uh, Brothers song about it, let alone um, the actual yeah. book. Uh, <laughs> lots of fun, I think, against right. Yeah, show me where the fun is in this 500-page thing of uh, yeah, automatic writing. Where's the fun, goddammit? Anywho. Yeah. By the way, we have great fun talking with Larry Kerwin. We want to remind people, we want to say that when, in a couple of months, God willing, Broadway will start to grind its gears, and we may see, is it Desert Rose was the musical you were talking about? The, the, about the, 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 first one that will, the first one that will come up, and it's scheduled for a year from now, because it's not going to open in a couple of months. It's going to open next fall, if, yeah. if then. Yeah. And uh, the, the play, or the musical then, uh, it was originally called Hard Times, and now it's called Paradise Square. It's become a much bigger play. That will be the first one. And then hopefully uh, Desert Rose will come on after that. Desert Rose is about the Iraq War, so. Oh, right, right. So wait, which, hard, which is the one that's Paradise Square? Is that the one about the band? Or no, no. Oh, that's, all, that's another whole different thing, too. Oh, all right. Paradise Square is set in 1863 when the Irish people who had fled the famine and uh, the African-Americans who had fled slavery met in a place called the Five Points in New York City. 
and mixed and had relationships and married, created tap dance at that point. And it lasted for about 20 years until the draft riots of 1863. So, um, yeah, I think I read somewhere that, or, or saw that you were inspired by a lithograph or like a, a drawings or cartoons yeah. of black men and, and Irish women dancing or something like that. I mean, it just inspired yeah. you to tell the story. Well, I knew the story, I knew basically the story, but when I saw the picture of them and saw the pictures of the bands who were playing for them, they were always mixed bands. It was a, an Irish singer, an Irish fiddle player, an African-American banjo player, and an African-American uh, percussionist. They were the four people in each of the bands that, that were playing. So it was a style of music. And then I got the picture. It was like, wow, now let me create this. This happens in the, uh, in the bar dance hall owned by a woman called Nellie Bly, the black woman. Yeah. Mystery, where did she come from? You know, it's, with drama, you always have to create mystery. Mysteries, you know, what's going to happen next? That's the, uh, the way it goes. Well, so, to follow my style of writing, anyway. to happen with uh, to follow what happens next with our friend of the neighborhood, Larry Kerwin. Do you have a website? Where can people find out about the, all the stuff that you're doing and when you start playing again or when you do like uh, you know, Zoom concerts if you do something like that too? Well, go to black47.com. That's oh, yeah. the NCK. Yeah. Four seven numbers dot com. That's a website, but you can also go to my uh, Facebook account, Larry Kerwin, K I R W A N. Or, or I have a show on Sirius XM too um, called Celtic Crush, and that's really popular. And that's called the Facebook page for that is called Fans of Celtic Crush. Fans and, of Celtic. Oh my goodness! That, that, so do you just play? You play Irish music, uh, like Killing a Gale or something. <laughs> I play any music that has a Celtic roots. Like there are eight, there are eight Celtic nations around Europe, uh, from Spain and France too. So it could be anything, but also any, anyone with Irish or Scottish roots in America, I play their music, you well, know. That's, that's so it, it's much broader than just Irish music, although I do play Irish music, of course, too, but you know, uh, it, it could be anyone, you know. Saying this is on Sirius XM. Look for Larry Kerwin, K I R W A N, for all the things that he is doing, both on radio and on, on literary and on musicals. Last question for you before we let you go, because I know you've got to make sure they don't knock down the wrong wall. You're a tiny <laughs> wall. That would be bad. <laughs> you have a favorite. He's like faulty towers downstairs. <laughs> oh, good God damn. You have a favorite. Hold on. Hold on. I get that rabbi, I'll choke him. <laughs> the, yeah, curse, yeah. the curse of the Jews is on me because I was sitting in that synagogue pew all these years. <laughs> yes, Don't break the stained glass. No, but, but let me ask you, a uh, favorite song by another person? Do you have a favorite song of all time by someone else? Yeah, I love uh, Van Morrison's um, Madame George. Ah. Story like song. Me. It takes her on a journey. Is that what we, I'm not going to say for you why you like it? Why do you like it? Well, I like it because it, it was pre the troubles in Northern Ireland. He was writing about an area I knew about. And also it's, it, it's that perfect mixture of jazz, folk, rock, literary, and mystery about this Madame George. You know, what is it? What's going on? You know, and he, he never finishes it off. So it's a bit like it's he was influenced by Joyce pretty much too, you know. My even, David's wife, I know. Yeah, but no, but yeah, James. No. Even in uh, he uses a little thing out of Ulysses in there when he goes, who, who loves to love the love that loves to love the love that loves to love the love. That's kind yeah, of Joyce, well, it's very Joyce and is that literally taken out of Ulysses? Yeah. It's not he didn't, you know, he was scatting it, you know, but that's where he got it from, would be Ulysses. Yeah. Well, I'm very sad, but we have to say goodbye, 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 goodbye to Larry Kerwin. Big 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 guy. He's such a wonderful guy. It has been delightful. And I wish you certainly um, seeing you on Broadway 
in a couple in a year or two, and plus reading new books by you and hearing you on the radio, Larry Kerwin, it just remains for me to thank you and say there's, there's a new book coming out in March. It's called Rock Rockaway Blue. It's about the Rockaway Pen Peninsula, but it's a mystery too. So um, oh my god, what's the, what's the, do you have, who's the publisher? How do you get uh, it? Cornell University Press. Oh. Oh, they do fiction, or is it? Or are we talking about history? Oh, it's fiction. Yeah, it's fiction. It's, it's set three years after nine eleven, and it's about something that happened during nine eleven, and it starts to come out. And uh, it's about a detective sergeant in the NYPD whose son uh, was a lieutenant who was a hero uh, who got killed during nine eleven, and then three years later they find out that he was actually in the building a half an hour beforehand and he wasn't supposed to be there. So what was he doing there? Had he come upon something? Was he investigating something? So it's, it's, it's a web. And, um, but I also always wanted to write about Rockaway. It's such an unusual and great, great area. And then, well, it's not too far from uh, Great Neck, New York, where I have my temple in a gas yeah. station. It's, it's, we're, we're very small. But ladies and gentlemen, be looking for Rockaway Blues, is it? Is the Rockaway name of it? Blue. Yeah. Rockaway Blue, just a single blue. May, well, if the book gets longer, maybe you'll, you'll pluralize yeah. it. Later. I got the blues after it. <laughs> Larry Carwin, a delight, health and good things to you, and shalom to you. And to you, it's to, to you. Oh, Rather. Slanta, yes. Yes, I'm kind of kind of slanting him myself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Take care of yourself, all right? You I better go and check on this goddamn wall. <laughs> <laughs> go before he, the whole thing collapses around you. Get out of here. Go, go. Shalom. Shalom. Uh, anyway, I'm going to remove you. Nothing, no offense. Bye-bye. Okay. Shalom. Larry Kerwin. Oh, shalom, shalom to you. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Yes, yes, yes. The Wailing Wall. Oh, um, the Wailing Wall. And Let's then see. his wall falling down. Oh, I didn't think of this. Oh, I will wail for him. Oh. That's how the people tried to do Rabbi uh, David White tried to love James Joyce. Yeah, yeah, David White, whose name is, whose name is Joyce, and who was born on Bloomsday, June 16th. Yeah. So she loves him. She was particularly. Dave told me this that she likes portrait of the artist uh, as a young well, man. When, when they say that she has. Skin of ivory, hair of gold, teeth and gold. It's beautiful. James Joyce is a beautiful writer. Beautiful writer. Joyce happens to be a beautiful woman, but Dave, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not looking at her in a yeah, naughty, non-rabbinical way. I said, you know, I can admire, I can admire from afar with a box of tissues and some Vaseline, but I'm not, I'm not touching. I'm not doing anything. Let me, <laughs> let me bring David back into the program to do more of the Dave's Gone by Facebook Yo show. And thank you for watching. Thank you to Larry Kerwin. There's more Dave's Gone by ahead. <laughs>